So welcome uh, to our sports scholarship webinar. Um, this is the second webinar in our spring series. Um, we're really pleased to um, welcome Vince Gamerick from the NCAA um, to tell us more about um, athletic scholarships. So before we get started, um, I just want to give uh, a bit of background on the Fulbright Commission, Education USA, um, and who we are as an organization. My name is Kirsty Callaghan. Um, I'm the communications manager here at the US UK Fulbright Commission. I'm also uh, one of the Education USA advisors here. Um, I spent a total of about four years studying and working uh, in the US um, and uh, that was first of all in the Pacific Northwest and later on in Wyoming. So I'm certainly passionate about helping students explore um, some of the roads less traveled. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so if you do have any, um, I'd ask that you hold on to them until then. You may well find that the questions you have will be answered uh, during the presentation itself, um, and there'll be an opportunity to ask them then. Um, this webinar will be recorded um, and then sent around to uh, all registrants in uh, the coming days, um, so you'll be able to look back on it as a resource. Okay, so before I hand over uh, to uh, to our guest speaker, I want to um, briefly introduce um, who we are as an organisation. Um, we are the US-UK Fulbright Commission. We were founded in 1948. Uh, we just celebrated our 70th anniversary last year. Um, and we were established in uh, the aftermath of World War II by Senator Fulbright, pictured there. Um, who believe that the best way to avoid another world war uh, would be to encourage uh, peace through um, a mutual understanding between nations um, through educational exchange. Um, this gave birth to our uh, to our commission, um, and we're a non-profit jointly funded by uh, both the U.S. and the U.K. governments um, to promote um, to promote that educational exchange. One of the ways in which we do that um, is through our Education USA um, advising services. Um, so we are one of 400 um, Education USA centers um, around the world. There are 600 advisors, um, all offering free, comprehensive, um, impartial advice to help UK students apply to the US. Um, we are the official source of advice uh, on US study here in the UK. So um, if you're interested in, in getting to the US and uh, learning um, how to do that, then we are here to help. Um, so, uh, I just want to introduce um, our guest speaker today. Uh, Vince is from the NCAA. Uh, I know that he's uh, a wealth of information um, and expertise on sports scholarships. Um, he's the NCAA coordinator of international eligibility analysis. Um, he graduated from Butler University um, in 2010, having spent a year abroad at the University of Sussex. Um, he then got a law degree from the University of St. Thomas Law School uh, in 2013 and started working at the NCAA in 2015 and has focused uh, on international eligibility since 2016. Um, so Vince, I will now hand over to you. Hi everyone. My name is Vince. Um, so the chat had mentioned that someone can't hear. I do just want to make sure that everyone can hear all right. Um, just go ahead and throw something in the chat if you can hear me, uh, Chloe. If not, I will just go ahead and get rolling. Okay, perfect. Good to know. Um, so, uh, as I said, my name is Vince. Um, I have worked at the NCAA since 2015. Um, I did go to Butler University and um, I did get a chance to spend a year in the United Kingdom in Brighton. The, the sunniest place in the United Kingdom. It was it was a wonderful year. So I definitely understand the the benefits of uh, an international education, and I really think it's a great growth opportunity for anyone to spend uh, some time in their post secondary education away from home. So today I'm just going to be giving a basic overview of really what you would want to know if you want to play college sports. Um, important to note here in the U.S., college means um, post-secondary, so obviously we, we understand that UK college is what we would call high school, um, but for us, college means that you're getting a, a degree. 
Um, so if you want to play college sports, here's just some basic um, information to have. At the end, we are going to have a Q&A session, and so you're probably going to have a lot of specific questions, and um, I'd be happy to answer those at that time. So today we're just going to talk about what are your options if you want to come to the United States and play college sports. Specifically, we're going to talk about how you become eligible for the NCAA. Really, there's going to be two parts to becoming eligible. Half of it is going to be your academics, and then the other half is going to be your amateurism certification, and what we're going to talk about both of those in detail. Um, we're also going to give you some resources, uh, useful web pages to look at or other documents to look at that may help you um, fill in the gaps and answer some questions for you. Uh, and we're also just going to briefly talk about recruiting, what it means to be recruited by a college, um, what it means to work with a recruiting service, and hopefully give you some background on uh, maybe some uh, do's and don'ts regarding recruiting. So what are your options if you want to come to the United States and play college sports? Well, really, there are going to be three main options. There, there are technically more, but these are the big three options. The big three options are the NAIA, the NCAA, and the NJCAA. Now, I work for the NCAA, um, but what all three of these organizations do is we govern college sports for certain colleges and universities. So, for example, some schools will be NCAA schools, other schools will be NAIA schools, and we're going to be totally separate. So, you know, if you go to an NAIA school, you would be playing under their rules. If you come to an NCAA school, you'd be playing under our rules. Uh, specifically, uh, the NCAA has three divisions that break down the different schools, and all three divisions do have slightly different rules. Um, the big difference between most of the divisions is, you know, generally your larger schools are going to be Division I schools, whereas Division three schools tend to be smaller, usually private schools, sometimes only with a few thousand students total. Lastly, just a couple of clarifying terms for you. Uh, a club team um, on a college campus would only compete against other club teams from other schools. It would not actually be the, the school's team, usually. So if you think of an example like Ohio State, um, you know, Ohio State University basketball team, they're going to have their basketball team, and then they may also have other club teams. Um, and then lastly, they could have intramural teams. Intramural teams are usually less formal, um, student-run leagues and teams that would be organized directly by the students in a lot of cases. So what is the NCAA? Well, we make up 1,123 colleges and universities. We have almost a half a million student athletes, so 500,000 student athletes that are currently competing at NCAA schools. 19,500 different teams, 90 championships across 24 sports, and three divisions. So uh, an absolute ton of opportunities if you're, if you're looking to play college sports at the NCAA. So here's the big question, how do I become eligible? Well, first and foremost, the most important first step is you're going to want to register, and you register at our website, which is Eligibility Center. Dot org, and you begin your process of becoming an NCAA student athlete. Importantly, there are two types of accounts that you can register for. You can either register for a certification account, which is a paid account. Uh, currently, international students would pay $150 for a certain certification account. Or if you're still weighing your options, maybe trying to figure out what you want to do with your college career, maybe you're not sure if you want to come to the NCAA at all. You can register for a free profile page, fill in all of your information, and then at a later date, if you want to upgrade that to a certification account, you can. Um, so certainly anybody that's debating whether or not they're interested in coming, or maybe um, they're, they're just not quite sure what the next step is for them, go ahead, register a profile page, um, and then it'll be there for you if you want to turn it into a certification account later. So importantly, we do have initial eligibility standards. 
Uh, the NCAA's commitment to academics ensures students are better equipped to succeed in college and prepare for lifelong success. Students need to meet the following academic requirements in order to compete in college sports. So to play Division I or two sports, you need to meet the following academic requirements. You have to present an acceptable form of proof of secondary school graduation. You need to complete 16 NCAA approved core courses in the correct subjects. You need to earn a minimum core course grade point average of 2.3. And then you have to earn an SAT or ACT score that matches your core course GPA on the division one or two sliding scale. So let's just talk about each of these bullet points briefly. And then obviously you may have specific questions later that I'd be happy to answer. So an acceptable form of proof of secondary school graduation for a student from the UK to us would be five GCSE exam passes, two AS level exam passes, or two A level exam passes. There are also many other forms of acceptable proof of graduation that we would accept, but those are the ones we're gonna see most commonly, especially GCSEs. Uh, taking 16 approved NCAA core courses in the correct subjects means that we're going to be looking for the equivalent of four years of credit in English, math, science, social science, and additional categories which can be fulfilled with GCSEs or other exams. Uh, a minimum core course GPA of 2.3 uh, means that you have to have a minimum overall grade average of between a US C grade and a US B grade. So you wanna be slightly above C, you don't have to be all the way up to B. And then the last bit means if you have a really good SAT score, then your GPA can be a little bit lower Consequently, if you have a really good GPA, your SAT can be a little bit lower. So they balance out, and as long as you're meeting the overall sliding scale um, and you have your 16 core courses, you'll end up being a qualifier and you can compete in your first year at your NCAA school. So here's the breakdown of the 16 core credits that we look for in each subject area. For Division One, you have to have four credits of English or native language, which obviously for students in the UK is just English, two credits of natural or physical science, three credits of math, two credits of social science, one credit of additional English native language math or physical science, and then four credits of additional anything, including foreign language, comparative religion or philosophy. So the way that you have to count to get to the 16 core courses can get a little complicated. I don't want you to worry that you have to have any of those numbers written down. These will all be published in the resources at the end of the presentation. So if you need to go, come back and look at this list to see if you're on track, um, this, this list is easy to find. So moving on to division two. Division two is just a little bit different. All of the subject areas are exactly the same as division one. It's just the amounts of each course you have to take are slightly different. So for example, you had to have four years worth of English for division one, but you only have to have three years of English for division two. You still have to have 16 core courses overall though. Again, it's just a, the total credits in each subject that gets moved around a little bit. So here's what you're gonna to wanna to submit to the Eligibility Center after you've registered at eligibilitycenter.org. We're gonna request your academic records for years nine and up in the native language. Um, we do not need translation for, for students from the UK typically, as, as long as your documents are in English. Importantly for us, year nine is also going to be known as form three or key stage three. Um, so we will request your academic records for years nine and up. We may end up only needing your GCSEs, AS levels and A levels if you take them. Um, every student's a little bit different, but your exams are going to be the most important document you can submit to us. Um, the exams are proof of graduation, including certificates, diplomas, or final leaving exams. Important thing to note is we do actually want official copies of your actual exam certificates, 
meaning the one the exam certificates that are issued by the exam board. Uh, at the top, it'll say, you know, Pearson, and then it'll say English GCSC, and then it'll have your grade with a double letter grade, and then it'll have a bunch of signs and seals on the bottom. That's the document that we have to have a copy of. Then once we get that, we need your SAT or ACT scores. Um, and then we can't accept TOEFL scores, um, which shouldn't apply to many people in the UK, um, but we just get asked about it frequently. So no need to submit TOEFL scores to us. So that's the academic side of things. Um, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the amateurism side. This is really going to ask you questions about your sports participation history. So here are some good tips that you can use to stay eligible to compete in college sports before you end up enrolling full time at that school. So here's just a broad overview of the issues that we review as part of the amateurism certification process. We're going to review whether you delayed your full time collegiate enrollment to participate in organized competition. What that means is, let's say you finish your GCSEs this year, and then you want to take a year off, and then you want to play for your team for a year at home, and then you want to go to your NCAA school the year after that. Well, that may be a problem um, because our rules require you to enroll at your NCAA school pretty soon after you finish your secondary education. Usually students get about a one year grace period, um, but it's different for every sport, especially tennis. Um, so if you have questions about your specific situation, um, it's probably just easiest to ask us directly and we can tell you exactly how the rules will apply to you. Other things that are gonna be reviewed is whether you play with professional players on your current team, whether you have signed a contract with a professional team, whether you've participated in tryouts or practices with a professional team, um, whether you've accepted payment or preferential treatment and benefits for playing sports in general, whether you've ever won prize money in your sport, uh, whether you've accepted any benefits from an agent or prospective agent, any involvement maybe you've had with a recruiting service, and the big tip in bold letters at the bottom, if you have questions about actions that could impact your amateurism, please contact us ahead of time and we can talk to you about all of the potential impact that any situation you're thinking about doing might, uh, might impact your overall amateurism certification. Always much, much better to ask us up front whether something's going to be a problem than to have it become a problem when you're about ready to go to your NCAA school. So here are just some general resources for you, just for more information about initial eligibility, amateurism requirements, um, and just other valuable insight that we might have. Here's a good list for you of useful websites. You've got our general website, ncaa.org slash play college sports. That's gonna have a lot of great information for you. The link below there is specifically for international student athletes. The, Kind of a long link, so um, might be kind of hard to type into the browser. Pretty much any of these, though, you can just type Google, type into Google NCAA, you know, International Student Athlete. And then as long as the link that you're going to, you, you make sure is NCAA.org, then you know that's our website. Uh, the last little bullet point there is eligibilitycenter.org. Again, that's the website you would want to go to when you're first registering an account with us, either the free account or the paid account. You can also get updates from us on Twitter. Uh, the Eligibility Center's Twitter handle is at NCAAEC. And then we also have an Instagram of at Play College Sports. You may have questions or have heard about something called the National Letter of Intent. That's a program where a school will sign you to an agreement that you play for them for at least one year. Um, technically, it is a separate program from us, but if you have questions about uh, letters of intent, you can go to that website, nationalletter.org. Uh, hopefully that'll answer any questions you have about that process. Lastly, there's a couple resources for you. Um, one is a guide for the college bound student athlete. And then the last one is a, a link to our international guide, the guide to international academic standards for athletics eligibility. 
really, really important for students from the UK. If you download our international guide, it's going to list all of the types of documents that we accept for proof of graduation. So it's going to tell you exactly what BTEC documents we would accept, what BTEC documents we would not accept, uh, NBQ documents we would accept, um, and then again, GCSEs. ASA levels, all of that information is in the international guide. Um, there's a specific country entry for the United Kingdom. So you just download the guide, scroll all the way to the bottom, and uh, find the United okay. Kingdom. All right, so there are many recruiting rules and services which may offer to assist you in the college recruiting process. It is 100% permiss permissible for you to use a recruiting service. However, there are some things to watch out for. You do not want to sign an agreement with a service. Sorry, Vince. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, it looks like we are having some issues seeing your slides. Um, okay. You are, would you mind being able to share your screen and pull those up? Yeah, no Please? problem. Can you, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Back to talking about recruiting rules. So, again, it is permissible for you to use a recruiting service. Um, you do not want to sign an agreement with a service in which you promise to pay them based on your placement at a U.S. college institution or your receipt of an athletic scholarship. So what that would be is you sign up for a recruiting service and they say, well, we're going to charge you 100 pounds, but if you get uh, signed with a school in the U.S., we're going to charge you an extra 100 pounds. That, that's a big no-no. You want to avoid anything that looks like that. So what we recommend is only use services that charge a flat fee. If they say our services as a recruiting service are going to be 10 pounds a month or, you know, 100 pounds overall, that that is usually okay. Um, as long as nothing is based on you getting into a U.S. college or getting an athletic scholarship. Uh, also, you do not want to let the recruiting service fill out any NCAA forms on your behalf. You definitely want to be filling out all forms yourself with your parents is totally fine, um, but you want that to be you and, and you alone that fills those out. Don't let some third party fill those out for you. Importantly, coaches, NCAA coaches, can only make recruiting contacts when students are a certain academic year in high school and during certain times of the year. Um, our general guides that are listed in the Guide for the College Found Student Athlete are written according to the American high school year terms. So ninth grade is freshman year. Again, that's form, form three for you. 10th grade is sophomore year or form four. And 11th grade is junior year or form five. Um, and then 12th grade is gonna be anything beyond um, your, your form five. You can download the guide to the College Bound Student Athlete for full recruiting guidelines for each sport and division. Over on the right-hand side here, we've just got some screenshots of the charts that list the types of contacts that can be made. And as you can see, the rules are different depending on the sport, depending on the year in high school for the student, and then depending on the, um, the, the time of year that it is. So it's, they, they do vary pretty wildly from sport to sport. So definitely got, download the guide and then check out the, the full list for yourself. All right, so you're, you're gonna wanna promote yourself to all of your the colleges that you're interested in attending. Most US college athletes are going to promote themselves to coaches in order to be recruited. That means that only a few elite athletes in very high profile sports will be contacted directly by coaches. So if you're promoting yourself, that means you should be sending emails, letters, videos to coaches directly of any school that you're interested in attending or playing for. Um, w w the nice part is, coming back to those recruiting calendar questions we were talking about a minute ago, maybe it's the time of the year where a coach can't talk to you. Well, they can respond and say that they can't talk to you right now. So the worst thing that would happen if you send a coach an email and they can't talk to you is they just say, hey, you know, sorry, I can't talk to you until um, this time, but please contact me again once we, once we are able to, to talk openly. Sometimes you can use a recruiting service. However, recruiting services are not necessary. They're completely optional, and you should not feel like you have to use a recruiting service unless you want to. 
Lastly, there are thousands of schools offering sports in the U.S. You should consider many more factors than just athletics when making your decision of which school to attend. Uh, does the school offer an academic program that you're interested in? Will you fit in academically? Do you want to go to the best or highest rated school possible, but you also don't want to get in over your head? You should also consider the athletic program by talking to the coaches directly. Uh, that can be a number of factors, including the time commitment on the team, the coaching styles of the coaches that are there, or maybe the amount of travel that you're going to be expected to do if you're on one of the teams. You should also definitely consider the intangible options for any school. Do you prefer a really large school or a very small school? Um, we have NCAA schools that uh, will have over 50,000 students, and then we'll have NCAA schools that will have 1,000 students or less. Um, those will be in big cities. Those will be in small towns. So um, choosing exactly where you want to go to school can make a, a very huge difference in the overall, um, the overall experience that you have when you come to a U.S. college. Here's just a good checklist of questions you can ask. While you're on a campus visit, you should just consider asking questions about these general topics. Um, you can, you know, obviously use this presentation, print these out, but I, I won't go through all of these one by one, but they're definitely um, good questions to ask any admissions department at any NCAA school. You can talk to your coaches about these. Maybe um, someone in the athletic staff on campus would have an, a, an answer to these questions. Um, for example, regarding injuries and rehabilitation, each NCAA school is going to have their own policies regarding um, medical staffing. And so you could ask them, you know, what that looks like. Who are the team doctors? Um, how exactly would that, would that work if I got this injury or that injury? Something like that. Definitely good questions to ask about. So what you should send to your school, you're just going to want to send them a cover letter or an email expressing your interest in their particular institution. You can send them your academic information, SAT scores or transcripts. Um, you can also put that on your NCAA account. So if a lot of times you'll, they'll just want to look up your NCAA account because maybe your SAT score and your transcripts are already on there for them to look at. You can send them a resume with your stats and results your times or your scores for any individual sports like swimming, track, or golf, tournament results um, for golf and tennis, um, and then also it's a good idea to maybe show the strength of the field. So if you are a tennis athlete, maybe list uh, who you beat and who beat you. Um, you know, if those players are ranked higher or lower than you, it's probably useful information to share with the coach. That way they can get a real good uh, they can get a good, real, real good feel for exactly how how you would fall in the overall um, progression for other students in the sport. You can also send them links to videos. They can be posted on YouTube, um, and that's a really useful way to show your skill set in real time. Um, just give them a video, and then they can watch it for themselves. So possible offers from an NCAA school. There are multiple different types of offers you may receive from an NCAA school, which are gonna range from uh, a full athletic scholarship all the way down to uh, just being, just trying out for your sport. So let's walk through each of those individually real quick. So an athletic scholarship means that all or part of your college or university costs are being paid and a commitment is being made to you. A recruited walk-on is someone who a spot on the team has been promised for them, but they are not going to receive an athletic scholarship. Importantly, with recruited walk-ons, coaches can change their mind regarding who plays on their team and when. So if you're only offered a recruited walk-on spot, you may actually not be guaranteed a spot on the team for any amount of time. If you get an athletic scholarship, then there are going to be rules that protect the athletic money that you're being given. Um, and then it's going to be a little bit different per scholarship. But um, again, it, it's going to be protected and it's a commitment. 
Lastly, a little bit below a recruited walk-on is going to be somebody who's an unrecruited walk-on or a tryout. That would mean you would need to earn your spot on the team once you arrive on campus. So me, for example, I did not play any college sports, but if I wanted to play for my college team, I could have gone to a tryout. And if I was good enough, maybe I make it on the team. Um, but typically an unrecruited walk-on is um, something that you would do if you really want to go to the school and then you decide you want to go and try out for the athletics program. Or maybe you really, really like the school and the athletics team, um, and you're, just, you're looking for that extra tryout to maybe prove yourself to the coach. So last, we're just going to have some general contact information for the NCAA Eligibility Center. Um, you can give us a call um, at either of those phone numbers listed. However, we only are answering international emails at this point for international students. So really, I would just recommend using the link to that at the international contact form. You fill out the contact form, it sends you, it sends us an email, we answer any of your questions, and then we just talk back and forth via email. Especially for students in the UK, hopefully that's a little more user friendly. You can write down your questions at whatever time is convenient for you, and then send it off to us. And then when we are open, we, we uh, would answer it and get back to you. Uh, lastly, down at the bottom, we do have links to all of the web pages that we talked about earlier, our Twitter feed, our Instagram, uh, general NCAA website, ncaa.org slash play college sports. And then last but not least, the eligibilitycenter.org, which is where you would go to register. All right, that's it for me. Do we want to go into the, the Q&A? Yeah, thank you so much for that, Vince. That was really useful. Um, and I apologize for the technical issues we had earlier on there, um, but we will look into sending around the slides um, to everyone who's registered so that you can review those uh, as, you, as you go through the process as well. So now we're gonna get started with the Q&A. Um, the best way to do that is to use the little Q&A feature um, on your screen rather than in the chat, um, so they're all in the one place. Um, I would ask you to try and keep these questions still fairly uh, general and broad. If there's a highly specific question you have that's more about your situation that won't apply to others, and um, that might be best to take that offline. Um, but if you have questions more broadly about the process, um, we can ask those to Vince and get answers. So I will give you a moment to pop those boxes, uh, those questions into the Q&A box, and then we'll get started. So I'm, I'm trying to read Holly's question here, although I, I don't think I know what an HRAD copy is. Holly asked for, uh, when sending transcripts and certificates, did they need to be sent as a, I'm guessing a hard copy in the post or is email okay? Um, at this time, we can accept all documents in either physical form or digital form. We would recommend sending them digitally if possible because that's hopefully easier. Um, we do have email addresses that you would receive once you register an account with us. And essentially what we would do is we would um, uh, open a task saying, hey, we need these documents and here's how you can send them to us. Um, at this point, all you would have to do is get your secondary school to email your documents, and we would accept them that way. All right, so let's see how I do that. Perfect. All right, I will start doing that. That way we have recorded answers. Um, so question from Sultan here. What is the lowest level of amateurism that is still attractive to colleges in the NCAA? Well, I think that's a great uh, question, especially because it comes back to the original slides that talked about how many colleges and universities we have. The NCAA by itself has almost 1,200 different schools. And so what one school may be looking for, uh, another school may be looking for something totally different. So no, I would say no matter your skill level, if you play your sport and you want to keep playing that when you're at college or university, um, then contact the schools you're interested in going to and see maybe if they'd be interested in you. They're all going to have different standards regarding uh, the types of athletes they're going to want. But, uh, you know, if they have the team on campus that plays that sport, then they're going to, um, th then they're, they're possibly going to be interested in you. Um, downside is you are going to have to reach out to them individually, most likely. 
um, but um, you know, maybe make a short list of the schools you're interested in, contact them all individually, and then hopefully they can give you good information on whether they're interested in you or not. <laughs> Thank you, Holly, I got that one. <laughs> uh, all right, so Tim asks what a certification page is. And without getting into too much of the specifics, if you ultimately know that you want to compete at an NCAA Division I or Division II school, you do have to register a certification page. The certification page, again, costs $150 US for international students. And that is where you would go through the process of officially submitting your documents, your SAT or ACT scores, uh, we would evaluate them individually for every student, and then we would do all of the calculations to figure out if you are going to be eligible to compete in your first year at your NCAA school. So the certification page is the paid account, the profile page is the free account, and um, the difference between the two is if you know you want to compete at Division One or Division Two, you will have to have a certification page eventually. Um, but you don't have to have it right up front. If, you, if you're not sure, register the profile page. If you know 100% you want to play Division I or Division II, then go for the certification page. So the, the question here is, what are the chances of gaining a full athletic scholarship for basketball? It's a great question. It's a great question about every sport. Uh, coming back to my answer a little bit earlier about a different question, every school is going to be different. Every school is going to have different financial resources, and then every school is going to have different needs in terms of their athletics program. So I think a better question is, you know, what are the chances of getting a full athletic scholarship for basketball at this school versus that school? And it could be widely, you know, very different answers between the two schools. It may also depend greatly on your athletic skill set. If you play a certain position in basketball, then maybe that team has a real need for somebody that plays that position, whereas another school may not need that. Um, so that's why I think reaching out to the schools individually will give you a good understanding of exactly what they're looking for and then maybe what your chances of getting a scholarship are. So Matthew asks, are full ride scholarships available in D1, D2, D3 men's soccer? So I, I, I failed to talk about it earlier, but athletic scholarships are only available at Division I and Division II schools. Division III does not allow athletic scholarship. However, they do have academic scholarships as, as do Divisions I and II. Um, so if you specifically want to get a full ride athletic scholarship, your only options are Division One and Division Two, and at both of those divisions, there are many, many programs that offer full ride scholarships. But as we talked about before, your scholarship offer could be they pay for everything, maybe they pay for half, maybe they pay for just a little bit, um, maybe they give you some athletic aid over here to kind of you know even out the costs. So um, it's important whenever you're talking to an institution to maybe get an understanding of the full picture of your total athletics aid, your academic aid, and then maybe what it's also going to cost you out of your own pocket before you make any real decisions. So Julia asked a really good question here. What's the issue with paying for a small fee up front with an agent with a bulk on receipt of a scholarship? Well, the real issue is that we have a rule in all of our rule books that says that you, we can't, you can't do that. Um, really, the rule was designed with the intent of protecting the student athletes um, rather than enter into an agreement with a recruiter that maybe is um, not in your best interest. Hopefully, having everything structured from a rules perspective as a flat fee structure is better for the student and the parents of the student so that you know that um, they're not just trying to get you a scholarship somewhere so that they can make some more money on the side. Um, so the, the real answer to the question, though, again, is we have a very black and white rule that says you cannot 
sign with a recruiter um, if they are conditioning your payment to them on you getting an athletic scholarship somewhere. So Jude asks, at what stage did you start applying to U.S. universities? My son is sitting his GCSEs this year. Well, now is a great time to register with the Eligibility Center at eligibilitycenter.org. Um, once he receives official copies of his actual GCSEs, um, to have the high school email us copies of those. Um, really, that's a good point for students in the UK to start actively talking with US colleges and universities. You can start before that, and maybe they'd be very interested in talking to you. But in the United States, usually 10th or 11th grade is about the right time to start the process um, in earnest. So um, if he's sitting for GCSEs this year, now's a great time to get that uh, process started. Uh, but certainly, you know, if you haven't started the process already, you're definitely not too late. There's, there's plenty more opportunities coming down the road. The nice thing with students from the UK is they can do their GCSEs and then maybe do A-levels two years later. Um, so it's actually, the timeline is a little bit more flexible than it would be with a US student. So, you know, your son, for example, may have a school that's really interested in bringing him on campus for next fall, fall 2020. Whereas another school may say, hey, we're more interested in having him come fall 2021, maybe even fall 2022. Uh, talking with the school individually, though, would give you a good understanding of what their needs are, what they have available, and you know, you can work out a plan between the two of you to figure out what's best for everybody. So Chloe asks, how long does eligibility take after sending off documents? Really good question. Um, it's a little complicated, but again, when you register an account with us, you are going to be issued a list of tasks. Certain tasks have to be completed before we would be able to process your certification, and you have to be added to a recruiting list by an NCAA school before we would activate your account and process your documents. But once we have all your documents, and we have you on a recruiting list from an NCAA school. Um, it only takes 10 business days at most for us to process your eligibility. The other reason it gets a little complicated is maybe you send something to us, then we look at it and we have to ask for something else. Um, the back and forth may take a, a while to get it all ironed out. We definitely recommend having students register as soon as possible. That way we can issue you the tasks, you get us the documents, we look at them, and then if there are any problems, we've got hopefully a lot of time to work through the issues before you have to be on campus at your NCAA school. So Tim asks, how heavily competed our, for our rugby scholarships? Um, I'm gonna be honest, Tim, I honestly don't know if we sponsor rugby. I know we used to, but regardless, let's just let's just generalize this to every sport. Um, every sport in general is going to be competitive, certainly, um, but different schools are going to be much more um, difficult to get a scholarship from than others. Uh, because we have almost 1,200 schools, the answer what it would take to get on a team at one school may be really different than a, uh, a team on another school. So I would say it's probably best to assess your own skill level or, or the skill level of, of the student athlete you know, um, and then you know send those emails to coaches at schools they may be interested in. Those coaches are probably gonna be pretty honest regarding you know what they think about the student athlete's potential and hopefully give you some really good feedback on um, opportunities that they think the student athlete might be able to pursue. So Julia answer, asked here, uh, do you need an American style CV with photos or is a traditional UK one okay to send to coaches? Really the answer is it's up to you. You can send whatever you want to coaches and they can take a look at it. If you think it would uh, be good to add photos or videos or anything like that, 
you can add it um, if you think that would be too much or you know you don't want to that's okay too um, there are no rules governing um, you know what has to be on a CV or um, you know maybe no, there's no requirements so it's it's definitely up to you to do whatever whatever you think is best in that situation So similar question we've had several times before, what are the chances of gaining a full athletic scholarship for basketball? Again, that, that's gonna depend on you as the, as the student athlete, and that's really gonna depend on the program that you want to play for. So the chances may be much easier at one school than another, uh, depending on uh, the student in general. The nice part is you can talk to the schools up front, you can get their feelings about uh, where you lie, what the chances of you getting the scholarship are, and then what they have to do is they have to say, hey, we're giving, we're offering you this scholarship here. Do you accept it or do you not accept it? So before you've committed to anything, you can figure out if you're getting an athletic scholarship or not, and if you don't get one, then you can, you can wait, um, reapply, um, or you can, you know, pursue other options at that point. So the question here this year is specific about soccer scholarships. How relevant or important is it for prospective candidates in the UK to attend summer camps that some colleges run to spot potential recruits? This is a great question that unfortunately I'm not gonna be able to answer. Um, there's no requirement from the NCAA that students attend any camps or clinics, but I, I think the, the person that asked the question is accurate in thinking that it may help you it may be good to go to the, the camp with uh, a particular coach that you're interested in playing for. It may also not be. So really that's gonna be up to you to determine whether you think it's gonna be a useful experience or not, but uh, there's certainly no requirement that any student do that. So Reese asks if an individual graduates a high school equivalent institute, and starts another high school equivalent in a different country, does your clock start? A bit of a complicated question. I'll try to um, break it down as best I think I can. Um, the long and short of it is, in the international guide, which we listed in the presentation, we list the graduation timelines for every acceptable proof of graduation document from every country. So your situation is probably one you'd want to contact us about directly, Reese, and we can walk you through all of the hypothetical scenarios. Um, your clock, the word clock is a little bit uh, nebulous, but essentially, as long as you're finishing everything on time, it's, it's usually not going to be a problem for you. The question is, what is on time? And that gets a little bit murky. So I would say just send us your specific questions about maybe what you're thinking about doing, and we'd be happy to walk you through this scenario and give you very specific answers to your specific situation. So the question here is, do I need to go immediately after GCSE, or can I wait for a university? Well, um, again, that's going to depend on the sport that you play, and then the last education document that that you that you complete so a very common path for example for students in the UK is they will do their GCSEs and then the next year they will work on uh, a, a different credential a, a BTEC level 3 diploma for example in that instance we would be able to give the student the benefit of having studied for the acceptable document that BTEC document in this example, and then they could actually wait usually another year before they go to their NCAA school. Um, it's, it's hard for me to get into the specifics with the United Kingdom in general, just because we have well over 20 different types of acceptable proof of graduation documents. Um, and so the specific scenario for any given student is gonna be different. Um, as with every other student, if, you know, I would just say, send us your specific questions about what you're thinking about doing, and we'll walk you through it. But definitely, as, as long as you're gonna finish an approved program after GCSEs, you do not have to go right away. Uh, but usually it's gonna be recommended that you are um, 
completing a document that would, would help advance your high school expected date of graduation. Again, complicated, <laughs> sorry for that, uh, but definitely send us your questions, we can answer them. So Holly asks, can recruiting companies be certified by the NCAA? Good question. Um, we do certify recruiting agencies in a sense, and really all we do is we have a list of recruiting services that have gone through our, our process, um, which really only means that we have given them good resources regarding do's and don'ts um, of how to comply with our rules. That being said, we do not endorse any recruiting service, and at any time, a recruiting service may be in violation of our rules, even if they went through the certification process. The certification process just confirms that they have been made aware of the rules, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're following them. If you want to know if they're following the rules, contact us directly and we can tell you exactly what the rules are um, and maybe exactly whether and or not what they're doing or, or offering to you would be within our rules. Um, again, it's always free to contact us. Just, just use that contact form, send us an email, uh, and then we will get you your specific questions. And definitely, it's always, always, always better to ask questions ahead of time um, than to do something and then ask for forgiveness later. So Thomas asks, how early would you recommend starting to send emails slash letters to different coaches or colleges? And how do you find the right contacts to talk to? Good questions. So uh, a few slides back at, towards the end of the presentation, we linked to our guide for college bound student athletes. That has the full chart for all sports and all divisions and all timelines regarding what is permissible. Again, though, the important thing to note is if you send an email and a coach cannot talk to you right now for whatever reason, they can respond and say, I cannot talk to you right now because of the recruiting calendar. So you're never ever gonna be in violation for sending something to a coach. Um, so really it's up to you to send them as, as early as you want. A general rule of thumb though is going to be year 10. Year 10 is most often um, when the majority of the recruiting process is going to start for most students at least in the United States. Uh, but if you want to start earlier than that, you, you absolutely can. Uh, just to touch on where do you find contacts, sorry I skipped over that part. What you want to do is you just want to Google the university athletics website. Pretty much every university is either going to have an athletics website or they're going to have uh, part of their university or college webpage that's dedicated to athletics. On that page, you're going to find specific contact information for all of their athletic staff. So that may be coaches, that may be the, just the, the sports staff there on campus. If you're unsure of who to email, really you can probably email anybody that's on the athletic staff website and hopefully they can direct you to the right person. So the question here is if someone wants to play their sport professionally, What's the best advice you can give? And what would that path look like? That's a, that's a really hard question, especially because the answer is going to be very different for every person and every sport. Really at the NCAA, we focus strongly on promoting the academic experience of our student athletes. We believe strongly that a strong uh, academic background coupled with uh, an athletic program um, in your college or university experience makes you a great, well-rounded person so that if you don't become a professional, that um, you're able to go into the world um, with a really unique skill set that you can use to your advantage. So mostly, honestly, at the NCAA, we don't, we don't focus on people that are going to be professionals. We're, we're more interested in the other 98 or 99 percent of student athletes that are not going to end up being professional. Uh, I think uh, we're 
probably going to have to wrap up there. I know there's a lot of questions coming, um, but we are out of time today. Um, thank you so, so much, Vince, uh, for, for all the information you've provided, all the questions that you've answered. I think if people have uh, questions um, remaining, then they can reach out to the NCAA Eligibility Centre directly. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening uh, and uh, just a reminder that we will be sending around this video uh, of the webinar as well as a copy of the slides um, for, you to, to, for you to review. So thanks again um, and uh, be sure to check the Fulbright website for more information on general US admissions as well as other upcoming webinars that we have.